when you have great coaches, then after you have great coaches, you get great players. You have a great organization, and you tell them one thing. Just win, baby. <laughs> listening to just pod baby a las vegas raiders podcast brought to you by silver and black today.com and now your host evan Grote. let's go raider nation welcome back to just pod baby thank you for joining me again this week i am your host evan Grote. just pod baby is part of the silver and black today media group which also includes our youtube page so make sure you're subscribing to both the podcast if you don't already and the YouTube page. Please read me, read, leave me a, a rating and a review. And while you're at it, give me a follow on Twitter as well at egrope 5 Just a quick rundown uh, of the plan for tonight. Going to be a brief show this week. It's been a busy week for me as I'm trying to get everything situated before we head out of town on vacation Friday. Uh, but I did want to make sure that I got a, a quick show out for you before I leave. Uh, I want to begin to, to shift uh, my attention from free agency t- to the draft, so we will do that by uh, bringing on our guest this week, Vic Tafer, Raiders beat writer from The Athletic. Uh, this week, Vic released a seven-round mock draft, so we're going to chat with him about that uh, and, and just kind of get his overall thoughts on how the Raiders did in free agency as well. Uh, but tonight, I want to begin by getting you caught up on some of the news from the week. And the big story was the contract extension for left tackle Colton Miller. News broke on Tuesday that Miller uh, and the Raiders had agreed to the extension, the three-year extension, $42.7 million in guaranteed money, $18 million per season. And that number makes him a top five highest paid tackle in terms of average annual value. Uh, just to give you some of my quick thoughts on this, I think it's very well deserved. I think, uh, you know, I'm I'm very happy. I'm glad that uh, they were able to get something done with him, and, and you know, they will keep him with the team through the 2025 season, which is which is a great thing uh, for the Raiders. You know, look, it, it's a lot of money. You know, there's no denying that, but it's a premium position, right? Left tackle. It's one of those premium positions. Uh, where where if you got a guy who who can play, he's going to get paid, and, and so that's what uh, the Raiders had to do, and that's the recipe that you look for. You look to draft a guy, you look to develop him, and then you want to keep him around. You want to pay him, and that's that's what it's all about: draft well, develop well, and and, and have him stick around. Uh, he still is only 25 years old, just now reaching the prime years of his career, and he's he's really developed nicely. Think about where he was in that rookie season, uh, where he fought through some injuries, showed some toughness. I thought he really won the respect of the fan base and his teammates by playing through some of those injuries. Sure, he had some struggles in that rookie year, but he has showed steady growth in each and every year since then. Uh, And, you know, he's developed into a very reliable left tackle, a really underrated player, in my opinion, I expect some Pro Bowls in the near future for him, and I think now what we're going to see from him is he steps into a whole new role on this team as one of the leaders along the offensive line. He hasn't really had to to be that guy in past seasons. Along with Richie Incognito and, and, and Denzel Good, I think Colton Miller is a guy that some of the younger players on the offensive line, like Andrew, uh, Andrew, uh, excuse me, Andre James and John Simpson, and perhaps a, another rookie, uh, maybe a right tackle if they do bring one in through the draft, which I assume they will. These younger guys are going to lean on Colton Miller for his leadership and, and for his experience. So that's going to be a new a new role for him. And you know, just, just one of the things that I really like most about Miller. Obviously, we know he's a very, very good player. He's very talented, but he's always available. He's always out there. He he does, rarely misses games, and you never hear from the guy. Uh, he just he just puts his head down and works. He seems like a real humble guy. Doesn't do a lot of media. I've tried to get him on the show here. I, I'm currently still trying to get him on. Um, you know, he doesn't. He's not a guy who 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 seems to seek the spotlight, right? Um, and, and I really like that about him. He just, it, he, it seems that it's just all business with Colton Miller. And from a fan perspective, 
that's really what you want from some of these guys. So you, you don't ever have to worry about Colton Miller. He's always going to be out there. He'll be prepared, and he's going to give you a, you know 110% effort. So I wanted to just get some of those thoughts out there to start the show. And, and then secondly, before I bring in our guest Vic Tafer tonight, I was on with Vinny Bonsignor again this week, and the topic of the draft came up. Uh, so before we start talking about the draft with Vic, I just thought I would uh, play some of the audio from my conversation with Vinny where we were talking about the draft and I kind of laid out uh, what I would like to see the Raiders do in round one. So let's take a listen to some of that audio now. Uh, we're talking to Evan Grote. You could follow him at egrote5. Uh, uh, he writes for Silver and Black today. He's also the host of Just Pod Baby. All right, I'm just reading between the lines from 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 what you're saying, Evan. I almost think that you'd be leaning towards something else in that first round. I, I you know, you could poke holes in my theory here, uh, but but if so, um, where would you turn uh, in the first round? Because it sounds like you're thinking more along the lines of tackle later on in the draft, not necessarily at 17. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're you're definitely uh, reading that correct. Uh, you know, look, obviously there are still some glaring needs that we're all well aware of on the roster, um, but I think in terms of, of this year's draft class in particular, there are many. You know, there's many unknowns out there um, that we more, more than we've ever seen in past years because of the number of opt outs that that have, have occurred in the past year uh, during college football due to COVID, right? Um, a great example of that is, is that edge player, uh, Gregory Rousseau, out of Miami. I mean, only started one year uh, with the Hurricanes, but was highly productive in that one year, 15 and a half sacks, 19 and a half tackles for loss, and then this past season he opts out. So that makes the evaluation process that much more difficult for the scouts because they just don't have uh, the, this, the tape, right? They don't have as much on film of some of these players. Um, so that being said, um, based on some of that, I would be in favor of a trade down. Now, obviously, you have to have a partner, right? That that scenario has to present itself. Um, so I would be all in favor of a trade down scenario, unless, of course, like a stud should happen to slip, a guy like Micah Parsons. And I know linebacker isn't necessarily uh, a position of need, but he's a darn good football player. And I do think that's what this roster needs is just to continue to add really good football players um, so if they had the opportunity to to pick up some extra draft capital um, and, and take advantage of the depth at tackle this in this year's class, slide down a bit in round one, um, you could you could possibly grab one of the top safeties that are still uh, that are most likely will be available there, Trayvon Morig or Richie Grant. Um, I say you have to at least consider that move, and you could probably still pick up, like I said, a plug and play tackle. If they were to pick up an extra round two pick, say for example, you could pick up a, a plug and play guy in, in round two. So um, that that's kind of something I'd like to see. Now, the one thing I will say about that, I don't know if that's necessarily in Mike Mayock's DNA. You think about his first two drafts, uh, first two drafts with the Raiders. He drafted two players in round one that many believe could have been had a little bit later on in round one had they maybe traded back. Now, again, we don't know if a trade was presented in those situations. But I'm talking about Cleef Farrell in 2019 and then Damon Arnett in the 2020 draft. So, you know, obviously, as I have been saying, a trade partner has to has to come about in order to make those things work. But we just haven't seen it yet uh, from Mike Mayock. Yeah, no question about it. And uh, and you sometimes wonder, you know, Mike didn't come up the, the normal path uh, as far as a general manager. I know he's he had a working relationship with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, personnel directors and, and, and people doing what he did on the TV side. But, you know, uh, sometimes when you when you are bounce around the league or come up through the league, you know, you make you make relationships uh, and you have friendships with other general managers and other people in organizations to kind of get, um, you know, and that helps facilitate uh, trades and things like that. So I think the, but I think the longer he's in this position, the more likelihood that those relationships are going to begin to build and strengthen, which probably could open the door uh, for some, um, you know, f- those type of trades. All right, so there you have some of my thoughts. What do you, what do you think, Raider Nation? Does it does it make some sense in in your opinion that if the if the scenario works out where the guy that the Raiders want is on the board? and they think they can get them a little bit later, maybe a trade-down is the best move. We have not seen the team be willing to do that in the in the previous two drafts under Mike Mayock, which I mentioned. But 
if it presents itself this year, I think that's the best course of action. I th- I really do believe that. I know they need a left tackle, uh, but there or excuse me, a right tackle. But I know that there's a lot of talented tackles in this year's draft class, and I fully believe that they, if they were to trade down a little bit later in round one, they could still grab uh, a tackle, a very good tackle, or maybe it's grab a safety or just the best player on the board, and you can still get a tackle in round two as well. So uh, I'm all for a trade scenario there. Let me know what you think. Reach out to me on Twitter. Send me a DM, and I'd like to get some of your thoughts on what you would like to see the Raiders do in round one of this year's draft. Let's now go out to the phone lines and welcome in our guest this week, Raiders beat writer from The Athletic, Vic Tafer. Vic, thanks for giving us some of your time tonight, and welcome to Just Pod Baby. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Very good. Thanks for asking. Um, You know, I brought you on this week. Uh, I thought you'd be a good person to talk to about some draft talk. I did read your seven-round mock draft that you released this week, and I do have some questions uh, for you about that. But before we get to that, I just wanted to get some of your thoughts on free agency, starting with the defense. They did land a big fish and and Yannick and Gakwe. Uh, who should absolutely help the pass rush from the edge, but but personally, I, I'm 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 still a little bit underwhelmed at some of the moves that they made to uh, to the interior part of the defensive line. They added some depth and some competition, uh, but I'm not sure if there's a true difference maker there. So that does concern me. How do you think they did uh, on addressing the defensive line? Yeah, I think they kind of attacked it with numbers. I think they got a lot of guys that uh, Gus Bradley uh, knows pretty well, like. Uh, Philbin, the guy he had was the Chargers, and uh, Quentin Jefferson, the veteran guy who can play inside, and Dickerson probably will be the backup nose to to Hankins. So I think they just add some bodies to it. They have guys from last year that need to step up, like uh, like Carl Nassib, and and Max Crosby played hurt, and obviously Cleo has to get better. But uh, and Hankins, I think, was good but not great. So I just think they're trying to get ideally a bunch of guys that can rotate, just kind of keep guys fresh, and kind of. Uh, get some pressure both inside and outside and then to make those jobs easier for everybody else on the defense. Now, now free safety is a, another position many of us assumed uh, that would have been taken care of uh, by this point. Uh, and, I've, and I've seen some of the, the, the tweets you've been putting out kind of uh, kind of joking with the fan base about the fact that they have not addressed that need yet. Um you know, th- that leads me to believe that they do have some plans for that position in the draft, and it seems based on your mock that, again, we'll get to in just a second, you believe that to be true as well. But um, quickly, I, I want to ask you a question about some of the changes that occurred on offense uh, during free agency as well. They added two wide receivers in John Brown and Willie Sneed, as well as another running back with Kenyon Drake. And, of course, th- the shakeup that occurred along the offensive line when you look at things right now, do you have any concerns with the offensive line or the wide receiver position? Yeah, I think so. I think, obviously, Nelson Aguilar was a huge player for him last year. came in, just was an impact guy, and they played you know, all over the field and kind of was a leader in, in the locker room. So I think they wanted him back. He got, he got a great offer from the Patriots. They couldn't afford to bring him back. So I like John Brown. John Brown's a nice piece. So he can – Probably play any of the three spots because you're a deep threat also. So I think that's a solid move. Um, well, it's neat. I'm not really sure. Um, I guess he's a tough kid and he plays a slot. But um, I'm a little curious because they had Renfro in the slot and they also uh, signed a, re-signed Zay Jones, gave him 2.5 million guaranteed. So I guess they're going to carry six receivers. And I think um, if you figure that uh, really the tight end Waller is the number one guy, then that group is actually better than you probably think it is. Yeah, you know. Um... I've I've kind of voiced my concerns. I mean, I I like the signings of of John Brown and and, and Willie Sneed, but I, I think what this signals is that they're definitely going to be all in with Henry Ruggs and Brian Edwards. I and mean, when we know they won the starting job out of camp last year, but we didn't see a whole lot from those two guys. I know there were some injuries and maybe uh, they didn't quite develop as quickly as they would have liked. But again, do, you're not at all concerned about the idea of going into the, this upcoming season with those two as your, your top two wideouts. Well, I think you have to, I think obviously if you invested, you know, first round picking rugs, he was the first receiver were taken. So yeah, it's a pretty strong statement. So, I think he has to do a better job. They mentioned that. I think John Gruden's got to do a better job with the play calling. So I think that it's on both those guys to get that job done this year. So in other words, I think flashed before he got hurt. And then when he came back, Aguilar taking his job, which was not really 
his fault, but he like he's a big target, big physical kid, so a lot of upside for both those guys. So I think when you pick those guys, that high first and third round picks, you got to give them a chance to like spread their wings and fly. I think same with our defense. You're looking at guys like Abram and Arnett and Mullen. So this is the year. The guys have up this year. I mean, Gus Bradley's a new coordinator. has to see what those guys can do, but I think once you draft those guys so high, you kind of, I don't want to say stuck, but you kind of made your move and need those guys to play better. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. It, it, you got to see what you got in these young guys. I mean, you, you use the high draft picks on, on them. You, you got to give them a chance here. And, and I think this is the year. Our guest tonight uh, on Just Pod Baby is Vic Tafer, beat writer for The Athletic. All right, Vic, let's dive into this mock draft of yours. I, I like where your head is at in round one. You have the Raiders uh, trading down with the Saints to pick 28 and selecting safety Trayvon Moore got a TCU. And in that deal, they added a additional second round pick. Um I've been saying on the show earlier that I believe that is the best course of action. Uh, should it, should a trade present itself, a trade down, uh, I, I think that would be the best case. But I also pointed out that Mike Mayock hasn't exactly shown the willingness to, to want to move down in, in round one. Think about the pick of Cleveland, Cleveland Farrell uh, in 2019 and, and, and then again with Damon Arnett in 2020. Both of those guys probably could have been had a little bit later on. Um, but you know he chose to, to stay put. We don't know if a, a trade presented itself at that point in time, but it, it seems like when Gruden and, and Mayock, when they get locked in on a guy they like, they, they, they really just go after him. They go get him. They don't want to uh, take the chance of, of trading down. Uh, but what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, it was clearly they definitely got stuck, and they liked him a lot, and they were planning. They thought it was probably like you know 10 through 15 values, so their plan was – to trade down and get them. That was kind of what they locked in on. And then what happened was come draft night, they couldn't find a dance partner. So they kind of got stuck where they were probably some of the guys who probably, you know, were better players in that spot, but they, I was their guy that they had done research on and liked his character fit and he could play inside and big guy sits the edge, got some pass rush skills. So they kind of uh, overdrafted him because they couldn't trade back. So I, I think they're always willing to trade back. I think in this case, if they are going to go safety, which I'm not sure they will, I think you can also go with the right tackle or the best player available. But if you go safety, in my mind, there's only two guys really who are up there in terms of being even like late round caliber picks, and that's you know um, the guy I picked and also Richie Grant. So um, I, I don't know. I, I don't see them picking them at 17. I think it might be a little high for me. Because I'm not sure the, the league values those guys that highly in this draft. But uh, if it's a need, and uh, if you're at 28, if you trade down, then there probably it might be best player available also yeah so let, let's say the scenario happens where there isn't a trade and they're they're at pick 17 would you still go with the safety over a right tackle or how, how do you prioritize those two needs at this point well ideally i mean you, you always you always hear the, the cliche best player available but no one really, really does it but i definitely would 17 i would probably take the best pass rusher the best linebacker if he's out there. I wouldn't take a cornerback, but I mean, I, I would try and not force it. I think you can take starting you know, a, guy, a guy in the second round who can start a right tackle before long or even the thing about safety is those are really those two guys. I think if you don't, if you really are stuck and you figure you want, well, you definitely want one of those two guys and you have to plug in them pretty soon, you may have to reach and take about 17, but ideally you don't put yourself in that situation. Yeah, so after the pick uh, of Morig uh, in, in round one, y- y- your next pick, uh, your first pick in round two, you go with uh, right tackle Alex Leatherwood uh, out of Alabama. And, and right off the bat, you address the two biggest needs, uh, safety and right tackle. And we just touched on the idea of, you know, I was going to ask you about uh, a player like Mika Ra- or Micah Ra- or Parsons, I'm sorry, Micah Parsons, the, the linebacker out of Penn State. Not necessarily a position of need right now, but you just mentioned best player available. Would he be a guy that you could see them making the pick at 17 as well? Ideally, but again, yeah, and, and I don't know they would because they, they have the two guys from last year they signed to you know, pretty good deals, and Kwiatkowski and Littleton, and they give uh, Nicholas Moore $4.5 million to come back this year. So that's three guys. So I don't know really if you can draft. I mean, like, you could go best player available, but then one of those four guys is going to sit a good chunk, so I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I, I think in their mind they've probably uh, made moves that they're not going to do that. They probably would talk themselves out of taking a linebacker there as far as it not being the quote-unquote best player available because they are kind of married, those three guys that have there this year, at linebacker. 
Now with your next, your, your second pick in round two, you go with a defensive tackle out of Ohio State. And I think that kind of confirms maybe what we discussed earlier about the defensive line. And in your, in your story, your mock draft story, uh, you made a great point that a lot of these new additions to the defensive line, they, only, they were only signed for one-year deals. So uh, I like your logic there of going with a defensive tackle because who knows what, what the, the situation may be at, you know, at this point next year. And then you also add a, a cornerback out of Syracuse and an edge rusher in round three. And the pick that I want to talk about next here is in round four. You selected another another safety, Andre, Andre Cisco, a guy who I really like, kind of a, a boomer bust uh, playmaker. Uh, he has great ball skills, but also gives up his fair share of big plays. Um, you know, you did use a, a, a first round draft pick uh, on a safety in Morig. Tell us why you decided to double dip at safety. I figured that, that spot really, I mean, not give it too picky. I think he's a guy that flashed on the board. And I think if you look at, like you mentioned, going past this year, Jeff Heath is probably this year, it's probably going to be his last year there. I don't think he's a long term fix. And I think really, uh, there's real question marks about Jonathan Abram. I think they don't really know what they have there. I think, I think they're optimistic they'll turn around, but uh, he showed some real issues in pass coverage. So maybe if you um, have an insurance policy, it's kind of very similar to Abram. This guy's kind of like him in a lot of many ways. So. Maybe you teach them both the same thing, see which one gets to the fix it up better and go from there. But I think it's just depth. I, mean, I think one of the problems that Gus Bradley saw when he came here and he watched all the film from last year was, besides the obvious issues with guys who didn't play well, like Malik Collins and some of the linebackers and the corners and whatever, but I think the bigger issue was the lack of depth. There really there was nothing there beyond the guys who started yeah, it's a great point you make there about the, the the issue at depth, and I and I do agree with you. I think it's a big year for for Jonathan Abram. He has to really show some 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 great signs of uh, improvement here. Now in round five, uh, you pick up a running back, uh, Hubbard, out of Oklahoma State. He had great junior year, put up huge numbers in his junior year. Not not so great numbers uh, this past season. Um, now the Raiders just added a new running back in free agency with Kenyon Drake, and they they did re-sign Theo Reddick to go along with uh, Jalen Richard. So that that right now that room looks pretty well set at this point. W- what inclines you to go running back with that pick? Again, just like I really went just best player available. I think both with Jalen. I mean, Jalen's making about three five this year. I know they like Jalen Richard, but at some point you may have to question that number for it really makes sense. Maybe. It, you're paying Drake eleven million dollars for the next two years, and you got a first round pick and Jacobs. Uh, the rookie will be a lot cheaper than that. So I think um, also theoretic is I'm only making a fifty grand guaranteed. So they like Theo, but I think Hubbard's upside might be bigger than those two guys. So maybe if he was there, you might take a flyer and see what you got. I mean, I think that always could use some more playmaking ability. So again, that's just for me. Uh, you look at the, the needs and what's out there on the board and, and that round and. I liked him in college. I thought he definitely showed me uh, some NFL ability, so I figured why not. Yeah, I like the pick as well. Um, and I just want to follow that up with a quick question about specifically about Jalen Richard. You know, whether they draft a running back or not, um, do you think that Jalen Richard's roster spot could be in jeopardy? You know, you mentioned he's making three point five million uh, this season. Um, as I mentioned, they did sign, uh, re-sign Riddick along with Drake, who can also catch the ball. Both of those guys are are, are pass catchers, um, which tells me it's possible Richard could be competing for his job this summer. What do you, What do you think about that? Yeah, I think there's always competition. I mean, that was my first reaction. I thought Joe might be in trouble. I heard some things where I think he's fine for right now, but obviously it was with John. I think it's fluid. I think. Um, that number is if they needed money, then that could definitely come in handy. They need to free up some cap space, but I think he's a big part of the team as far as just you know, they can return kicks. He's good out of the backfield. He was a great blocker, that big uh, key block, and that went over the Jets on the last play. He's definitely a guy who's become kind of a leader for the young guys in the locker room. So I know John likes him a lot. I think um, in their minds right now they're okay going with um, with Drake um, and uh, Rashad and, and Riddick backing up backing up Jacobs. Uh, last question I have for you, and this one is is about the head coach John Gruden. Um, he's entering his, his fourth year uh, as the head coach. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say he's on the hot seat. He, he you know, he signed a 10 year contract. There's been some some steady signs of growth, um, but I do think there is some pressure on this team to win now. They they've been in position each of the last two seasons at six and three and, and six and four, and they've had terrible finishes uh to the season 
How would you assess Gruden's, uh, the job he's done right now, and do you agree that there is some pressure on him and this team to get it done, make the playoffs this year in 2021? No, I think if Gruden's seat is hot, he can just throw it in the garbage and get a new seat. I think he definitely is fine for a while. I think Mark Davis brought him in. You know, he courted him for a long time. I think, bottom line, despite what happened, they kind of collapsed the last two years. They haven't proved they were 8 last year, so they can definitely – I just put that stuff in their cap and say we're getting better. So, I mean, there's still some concerns about the team building, what they've done so far. But I don't think John's in any way um, in trouble or out of pressure or a hot seat. I think if anyone, if they had a bad deal, let's we'll say, you know, devil's advocate was for the worst case. Now they have a, so they go 6 and 10, next, like 6 and 11, right? Or seven, yeah, 17 games. So, seven, so they go 7 and 10 next year or whatever. And, uh, six and eleven is a bad year. He's not going to be the guy in trouble. It's going to be either Mike Mack or Derek Carr. So I think, um, I, in no way is John Gruden uh, worried about his, his future. I think at this point, the only way he'll be leaving if he gets tired of this and he gets too too stressed out over the lack of progress. But I think he's all right. I think he's in it for a long haul. And I think he, um, I think he's uh, every year he gets fired up for, for a new challenge. Vic Tafer, everybody, absolutely great stuff there from him. Thanks, Vic, for uh, giving us some of your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. I look forward to reading all your your coverage of the draft and and, and, uh, off-season programs and whatnot, and we'll we'll touch base with you down the line. All right, bud. Take care. All right, we are back on Just Pod Baby. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Vic Tafer. Some really good insight from him into the draft. And, you know, and don't forget, Vic was the first one to suggest – that Rodney Hudson could be cut. I almost brought it up to him. I thought he was crazy when, when he first said it. When I first heard him say that on his uh, State of the State of the Nation podcast, I thought he was nuts. Uh, but he called it. He, he hit the nail on the head with that one. So when, when Vic speaks, you better be listening because he is as connected with this team and this organization as anyone else out there. And just, uh, again, a big thanks to Vic for coming on with me today. Okay, guys, that is going to wrap it up for this week. I need to get out of here. I've got some bags to pack. Again, just a reminder, there will not be a show next week as I will be on vacation in Florida. Uh, But plan on hearing from me two weeks from now, episode 100 of Just Pod Baby, a very uh, monumental uh, moment here for the show. Really looking forward to it. Got a confirmed guest uh, today, someone I'm really looking forward to speaking to. Um, Take care, everyone, and until then, I am your host, Evan Grote, and as always, just win, baby.